Welcome to the Power Is Now Radio. Your host and founder of the Power Is Now Incorporated, Eric Frazier. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Power Is Now. My name is Eric Frazier. Thank you for joining me this evening. It's another beautiful day in Southern California and a great day to talk about real estate. And I appreciate those of you who have taken time this evening to uh, join me. And I certainly hope tonight uh, will be another uh, incredible night of great information uh, that can help you uh, in your quest to become a homeowner. Uh, tonight is our first time home buyer seminar, and every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we are live on Facebook and also on Blog Talk Radio. So, Facebook and Blog Talk Radio. And I appreciate those of you who tune in every Tuesday night to uh, see what we're doing and to uh, uh, watch the uh, lessons that we're sharing about the home buying process and about various uh, first time home buyer programs. Uh, also, I appreciate uh, my team, uh, Powers Now agents, uh, both from Northern Cal and Southern California, who invite uh, uh, consumers to listen in every Tuesday night. And I certainly hope that, that is the case for those of you who are watching tonight that you've been invited to. Uh, participate in the show this evening and um, that you were invited by a real estate agent with the powers now or perhaps one of our great real estate agent partners out there who um, leverage our resources to help uh, consumers get the information they need and to know and understand about home ownership and the loan programs and we specialize in programs to help people get into homes with very little to no money down. That's our specialty. We also do, you know, every other kind of loan you can think about as well. And uh, we're very uh, proud to be able to be called and are a full service mortgage lender. So I'm talking first time home buyer, move up buyer, investor. Um, if you have income or no income, credit or no credit, money or no money, uh, we have it all. In fact, we never say no here at The Power Is Now. We never say no uh, to our uh, clients. We always find a way to make it happen. And I think that's important, especially for someone who is starting the process. And I know it can be daunting. There's a lot of information that you need to know. There's a lot of things you need to do. It is not easy. If anybody says it is, they are not telling you the truth. They are not telling you the truth. Because it is not easy, folks. It is not easy to become a first-time home buyer. In fact, it's not even easy for move-up buyers who've already been through the process. And uh, but we do our very best to try to make it easy for everyone who is uh, interested in investing in real estate or buying their first home. So um, don't let the fear uh, and don't let uh, uh, the amount of work and the requirements scare you away because in the end, when you've been able to achieve the goal, I'm telling you, it is so worth it. Uh, it really is. Uh, you'll look back five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, and you'll think it was and believe it was the very best decision you ever made uh, to buy a home. Even now, I mean, we are reaching out to our uh, past customers who bought a year and two and three years ago, and some of them are sitting on $100,000, $200,000, $50,000 equity in their home in just a year to two years. And so what, what? it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing the power of uh, home ownership and what it can do to help you build wealth and to change your life. Uh, for those of you who are just uh, joining us, uh, we are live on Facebook and also on Blog Talk Radio. And I want to encourage our audience on Blog Talk Radio and those who are listening on, if you're listening to a past show on iTunes, go to facebook.com forward slash The Power Is Now and watch some of our past shows. You can also go to thepowerisnow.com and uh, find our shows on the Powers Now TV and our radio and the radio magazine. Now, the Powers Now is a media company began in 2009. We started off doing teleconferences, and then we rolled in, in April of 2011 to Block Talk Radio. 
That's when we started. April 2011, well over a million downloads of our show. We're very proud of that. We're syndicated to iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, and a whole bunch of other online radio platforms. And so you can find us. You Please subscribe to us on all the online radio flat platforms. You can find us there. Then we launched the Powers Now magazine, which is on our website, and it's through the issue, isuu.com platform, over a million readers of our magazine. And we also have a radio magazine and as well as a real estate magazine to promote real estate listings. In fact, we're coming out with a brand new magazine. I'm so excited about it. It's the HUD Listing Magazine. I'm talking every HUD listed, every HUD property listed in the state of California. We're writing about those properties. We're putting all the pictures in. And uh, I tell you, it's a great buy for a first time home buyer to buy a HUD foreclosed property. Did you know that you can buy a HUD foreclosed property as a first time home buyer with only $100 down? $100 down. And so we're going to be writing about that program as well as putting the images and, and information about all the HUD listings in, in the state of California. And so look out for that magazine coming to you soon. Uh, within the next two weeks, that should be out. And every single month, we'll be updating it. So if you're looking to buy a HUD home property, we can help you here at The Power Is Now. So media, magazines, radio, and, of course, live events on Facebook every Tuesday night. Every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. In fact, this afternoon uh, at 1230, we had our Power Lunch and I had Denise Mathias and Linnell Holden talking about the KREP conference, which is coming up October 24th or the 26th. And folks, that conference is definitely something you should consider attending. Uh, I have a conflict, but I'm trying to work it out. Uh, they're going to have some incredible speakers that are going to be there, some great training. And I highly recommend you check out the NAREP conference, the KREP conference. Go to CAREB.org. And all the details on the website, in fact, it's also on our website under the Power is Now events. Uh, you can see it under national and local events, the KRAB conference coming up October 24th through the 26th. And then, of course, next uh, this week uh, on Thursday from uh, 1230 to 130, you should tune in because we're going to be talking about business opportunities for sale. Every Thursday from 1230 to 130, we're talking about real estate for sale. It's a marketing session. That's what it is. And so if you're an agent and you have something to pitch, you should join us. If you don't, that's okay. We're pulling great deals straight from the MLS, folks. Properties for sale, a businesses for sale. And our theme this coming Thursday is businesses for sale. Have you thought about buying a Subway, a Subway sandwich shop? Well, it's for sale. A hamburger shop is for sale. A clothing store is for sale. A chiropractor, CPA, medical office, it's for sale. Have you thought about buying a florist, a donut shop? It's for sale right on the MLS. And we're going to talk about some of these business opportunities that are for sale this coming Thursday between 1230 and 1.30 in the afternoon. So, folks, we've got a lot going on. If you go to thepowersnow.com, look under events, you will see it all, folks. A lot happening. I haven't even talked about our realtor seminars in fact, look on the Realtor Seminars. That's coming up, two coming up October 24th and November 4th for real estate agents who are looking to grow their business. Uh, and then, of course, first-time homebuyer seminars uh, that we have scheduled in Northern California and Southern California as well. Now, the Powers Now is licensed as a real estate company in the state of California only. And our license number as a real estate company with the California Department of Real Estate is 1980407. 4 and we're licensed as a mortgage brokerage, the Powers Now Mortgage Services. And our license number is 1435243. Uh, again, license only in the state of California. I'm the broker for both. So my individual license number for the Powers Now Mortgage Brokerage, the Mortgage Bro Services, is 46107. 46107. 46107. I believe that's correct. Let me do it right. 461807. 461807. That's my individual license number for the Powers Now Mortgage Services and my individual license number for the, uh, the Department of Real Estate. Uh, the Powers Now Real Estate Services is 0114384. All right. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about how to apply for a mortgage. And I'm going to talk about a few things 
that you need to do first, things you need to think about first as you begin this journey in buying a home. And then I'm going to talk about uh, what are the documentation requirements of getting a loan. Uh, so some of the things you need to have in place, ready to go uh, when you're ready to start your mortgage. So that's what we're going to talk about today on the Power Is Now First Time Home Buyer Seminar live on Facebook and on Blog Talk Radio. Now, if you have a question, you can call in at 323-843-6082. That's 323-843-6082. Now, uh, if you don't want to call in and ask a question, then of course, you can do so right here on Facebook and uh, you can ask your question in the chat room and I'll make sure that I get to your question and answer it. And so ask a question for yourself, ask a question for your friend or for a family member, ask the question. I promise you uh, that there are no silly questions. There are no stupid questions whatsoever. Ask a question and I promise you a great answer. All right, so we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're gonna get right into it, folks. Right now, we're going to hear from the power is now. You know, we are a media company as well as a real estate company. We're helping people. We are helping people, folks, every day become homeowners. We're making the dream of homeownership a reality. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this commercial break. Looking back, I certainly recall one of the greatest moments in my life. The day I set foot in a house that I purchased on my own. Man, what a morning I'll never forget. The American dream lives on. The Power Is Now Buyers Club is here to help you achieve it right now. We have access to lenders and nonprofits who are willing to give you the down payment for a home when others are not. That's right. The down payment assistance is not a loan. It's a gift. Find us at thepowerisnow.com and let's talk. Own your home today. Live the American dream. Thepowerisnow.com. The future is here. Living the American dream, folks. That's um, that's what anyone is doing who owns a home. They're living the American dream. Uh, and I know that we went through 2008, and that American dream became an American nightmare. Uh, but things are much better now. In fact, they're a little too good because the Federal Reserve just raised interest rates. And so interest rates are rising across the board. Uh, for many people, it's going to be... Um, Challenging because of higher interest rates. Uh, they're going to have a higher mortgage payment. Uh, for some, uh, it is no longer challenging. It's just not even possible. They can't afford to buy. They're going to have to move, uh, maybe move further east, or maybe even move out of the state in order to find something affordable. And of course, I don't want to encourage anyone to move out of the state. Uh, you can find something here. California is a great place to live uh, and work, and um, we pay the highest wages. We have the best weather in the country, uh, and I think uh, the best uh, lifestyle that goes with it. So uh, I encourage you to find a place to live out here. One option and not moving and maybe not moving further east, because it's always east. You know, here in Southern California, go east if you want affordability. And Northern California, go east if you want affordability. It seems like the west is always more expensive, right? It always is. And so... Uh, look at going east, and if you can't even go east to find something more affordable, then consider partnering up uh, with a family member or a friend to buy a home. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, first of all, how to apply, what you need to think about before you get started in the game, and then I'm going to do a deep dive on the documentation requirements so you can understand why it's so important to be ready uh, when you make that decision to move forward. So one of the things that I, I, I'm finding and talking to people, talking to first-time home buyers all the time, every day, I mean, I spend my entire day talking to people about buying a home, all right? And the, one of the things that I just, uh, I have noticed, uh, and this is with just about everyone I talk to, is that they're simply kind of not aware of what's going on. They're not aware. There is a, there is a sense of uh, naive, uh, naive, naivety, uh, and a sense of uh, a financial illiteracy. And I want to say a sense of it. I mean, not that they are financially illiterate, 
but they're just not paying attention. They're not paying attention to the news. Uh, they're not reading any books on uh, on uh, the process, on home ownership, on real estate, and they're just simply uh, not aware of really what's going on and what it takes. And so as a result of that, many people, because they haven't done any reading uh, or consulting with perhaps existing homeowners, what have you, they simply have unrealistic expectations about the home ownership process, about home ownership in general. Uh, and the first time those uh, expectations are being brought to reality is when they're sitting down with their lender. And that's not always uh, a pleasant experience to hear the truth, the cold, hard truth about you know where you're at, what you can do, uh, and, and why, all right? So with interest rates rising and the Federal Reserve very concerned about inflation and about um, the economy just growing too rapidly, uh, the impact of that on first-time home buyers is significant. As interest rates go up, uh, underwriting guidelines tend to tighten. Uh, as interest rates go up, uh, the economy begins to contract a little bit because what 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 uh, increasing rates do is pull it pulls money out of the market. That's what it does. When you want to slow down the economy, start raising interest rates because all you're doing is basically pulling money out of the circular flow of money. And it, we need money to be flowing in order and, and businesses putting that money to work, investing in people and, and equipment and resources and, and growing. And when you start raising interest rates and pulling money out of the economy, things begin to slow down. Uh, companies begin to lay off. It's already in the news. Already in the news. Banks are laying off people. Uh, companies are laying off people. Uh, companies uh, are, are stopping orders and they're, they're, they're slowing down investment. And so this is what happens. Um, and the Fed believes that this is the right thing to do uh, because they're trying to fight with the ugly monster called inflation uh, and, and add inflation with higher interest rates. And um, we run the risk of a recession. Uh, we run the risk of even a depression. It just depends on how far they go with monetary policy. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter if the rates go up, there's gonna always be a buyer and a seller. I mean, I bought my first home and interest rates were in the digit, double digits, and I know many people who did that. Uh, and this is another uh, kind of reality check for millennials. Uh, they think that 4% is normal, uh, four and a half, five percent 5%. I had one customer today kind of shock that the rates were 5%. I had one client who doesn't wanna refinance and pull out the cash, they need to, to buffer their reserves. I mean, they have no money in the bank, no money. They have a moderate salary as a teacher, no money in the bank, literally. They're living paycheck to paycheck. And they have an opportunity now to, because their home has increased in value, to refinance, only increase their payment, maybe $100, and put an extra 30 grand in the bank for reserve. And mind you, they have no money. They have no money. She is shocked that she may have to pay because it's cash out, a 5% interest rate, almost 5, 4.875. And she doesn't want to lose her 3.75 interest rate that she currently has on a mortgage. But let me tell you, uh, one of the biggest problems I see with most first-time home buyers, and for that matter, most buyers in general, is that they have no savings. Even if they have money in the bank, and once they put that money down, plus their closing costs, unless they're getting some help from the seller, they are broke when they move into that house. And so being broke when they move into the house, the first thing they do is they run out and they put on credit, furniture and appliances and things of that nature. So they go from buying a house and being broke and then to being buying a house, now owning a house, being broke and in debt. And, and then to add to that, no reserves. And so we have been reaching back to some of our past clients and said, hey, while rates are low and there's an opportunity, you got into this home with no money down through a gift program, you have an opportunity now to build up your reserves in case something happens. Hey, you got into this home with only 3.5% down, you had the money, you have an opportunity now to get to pull some cash out with a marginal, minimal increase in your payment 
and, and to buffer your reserves. Because let me tell you something. Life happens and terrible things happen to really good people with the best intentions. And as a result of that, them not being prepared, they end up losing their homes. Let me tell you, the number one reason why people lose their homes is not because the company shut down and they, had, they got laid off and had to wait six months to find another job. It's, it's not because they got really sick and uh, they couldn't go to work or, and, or, and, and, and as a result of that lost their job. It's not because uh, the company kind of cut back and reduced their hours and now they're only getting you know 30% or 70% of what they normally earn. It's not because somebody died, uh, the husband died or the wife died and now their income is significantly less. These are not the reasons why people lose their homes. They lose their homes because they don't have any money in the bank. Let me say that again. They lose their homes because they don't have any money in the bank. That's why people lose their homes. And so when you are looking at buying a home, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you should have money in the bank before you buy a home because you're paying rent right now, which is probably equal to your mortgage or maybe a little less than, and you don't have any money in the bank. You've got to have some place to live. You have to have some place to live, no question about it. And, you know, one of the great benefits of owning a home, if you run into financial trouble, there's all kinds of programs that are available for you. Heck, the state of California will even give you money. They'll, they'll, they might, lenders will modify your mortgage, move the payments you're behind or miss to the back. Uh, there's all kinds of programs to help you when you are a homeowner and you get in trouble with no money in the bank. But when you're a renter, heck, you have nobody, nobody but the landlord. You are completely at the mercy of the landlord. Man, will you just, you know, this happened, that happened. If, can you just, you know, do, can you just give us another two weeks? Can you give us another 30 days? I'll catch up, I promise. You're at the mercy of the landlord. How do you want to live like that? Nobody should have to live at the mercy of another entity or another individual who is the owner of that property, right? You shouldn't have to live at their mercy because that's exactly what you're doing, living at the mercy of the landlord. And the landlord says, nope, I'm sorry, man. I needed that rent because I needed to pay the mortgage. No, I'm sorry, man. I needed that rent because that's my, that's my, that's my income. I, I need rent to live. You're part of my portfolio, my retirement income. No, you need to pay me. I need to, you need to leave. That's as, it's as simple as that. And so you have no help when it comes to when you're renting, like you have when you own a home and you get into financial trouble and you have some challenges and you can't make the mortgage payment. Man, there is so much help. I've told every single one of my clients that we've helped get in a home. If you get in trouble, if you can't make the mortgage, call me, call me. I will help you. I will help you work through it. So I can knock on wood. We don't have any clients that have lost their home through foreclosure. It has not happened and it's not going to happen on my watch. There's just way too many resources available to people today because of Dodd-Frank, because of the great financial crisis, for anyone to be losing their home. If you're losing your home right now, it's because you're not being transparent with those who love you, those who have helped you in the past. Uh, you, you're not uh, being uh, honest with yourself about kind of where you're at and seeking the help you need. There is help for everyone. There really is. You do not have to lose your home. And it's one of the benefits of being a homeowner that you have that kind of those kinds of resources that are not available to any, any, any renter at all. And so uh, I, I want to encourage you to focus in on... Um, on saving money, uh, and if you own a home already, uh, I this is two homeowners. You know, don't don't let someone talk you out of it. Don't don't fall in love with a low interest rate. Here's the reality: what's going to happen? Mark my words. This is being recorded, so you know, five years from now, you can come back and listen to this show. Mark my words: five years from now, seven years from now, something's going to happen, and you're going to need money. 
And instead of interest rates being 5%, they're going to be 12 or 13%. What goes around comes around. We live in a cyclical society, just like, you know, fashion keeps uh, becoming old fashioned, becomes new, new becomes old, and just keeps going around and around. Google the history of interest rates. I'm telling you right now, what we have experienced in the past, we will experience in the future. It is not an if, it is a when. There is no uncertainty about it. Uh, it is going to happen. That's why the Fed is making the moves they're making to try to slow the process down. They cannot stop it. All they can do is slow it down. We're headed back to high interest rates. We're headed back to high inflation. And with all that uh, is happening in the world today, and particularly specifically with uh, the initiatives that are being done right now with trade, uh, we can see our economy really picking up, inflation really uh, being an issue, and of course, interest rates being higher. So this is the time. If you own a home, this is the time to get paid, right? Get some money out of that, set it aside, start stacking up your cash. If you're an investor, for sure, you need to think about liquidating because you're going to see a bump. You're going to see an adjustment in prices. It's going to happen, right? And so you know if you're peaked out or not. You bought that for you bought that investment uh, to achieve a certain yield, a certain amount of cash to appreciation. You know it's there already. It's time to take the money and stack the cash and get ready to go back in because it's it's the old school, right? You buy low and you sell high. Right? If you're a first-time home buyer, you need to get in where you fit it because it doesn't matter if property values adjust when interest rates go up in a year or so, uh, you're still dealing with the same circumstances. You can pay a lower price now and a higher uh, you can pay the price now and a, and a low interest rate or you can pay a lower price now and a higher interest rate. Guess what? The payment's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. So all you've done is missed out on, you know, a year or two of interest write-offs and tax, writing off your property taxes. And if you bought an income property, you're living in one unit, writing off depreciation, you've missed a year or two or more of all the kinds of tax benefits you get for home ownership. All right. So uh, I've shared a lot so far. And uh, if you agree uh, with what I'm saying, please let me know. If you disagree, I want to know, too. Um, I would love to hear your feedback. Um, this is my opinion of what's going on and what you need to do based on my 36 years of being in the trenches, buying and selling real estate, making loans and looking at thousands, literally thousands of applications that I've looked at over the years and where, where people are at when they start the process and where some are at when they end the process. I have one client, and I'm going to tell you this story, and then we're going to get into uh, the, uh, the seven, it may say seven or eight things you need to, to know before you start the application process, and then we're going to get into the documentation. So I have a couple clients who are single African-American women who bought a four-unit building uh, uh, both about two years ago. Uh, they paid about 800000 for those buildings. They're worth about $1.2 million in two years. They are sitting on an additional $400,000 in equity. Uh, the properties are cash flowing to the extent that not only do they not pay the mortgage, but we're talking about a close to $1,000 in monthly cash flow as a result of buying a four-unit property. They went from paying rent to not paying a mortgage, but to getting paid, right? I mean... Their rent on the income is enough to pay the mortgage payment plus put money in their pocket. And so now it's time for them to look at doing it again. And the question is, do they do a single family or do they do another four unit building? I'll let you know what happens. I'm recommending that they go again for another four unit building and just run this play one more time. Uh, do this at least three or four more times before they retire. That's 16 units. Uh, at about two grand a unit, that's thirty-two thousand dollars a month in income, passive income from real estate. Uh, who the net on that? I'm not sure what it would be based on the debt and what have you, but it will be significant. So I highly recommend that you buy real estate, whether it be a single-family home, two-unit, three-unit, four-unit building. The appreciation, the interest write-off, the cash flow on units—it is just unbelievable, folks. It's unbelievable.
what real estate can do. And as you can see, I get excited talking about real estate. All right. So let's transition and get right into our subject matter today. What are some things you need to know um, when you start the process of buying a home? Well, the first thing is that you need to know um, who you need as well as what you need. All right. You need to know who you need as well as what you need. And let me explain what I mean by who you need. All right. Because this is the first thing you need to know. Who you need. Well, when you're starting the process of buying a home, you already know, based on your income, based on your debt, that you don't make enough money. All right, you already know that. You don't need me as a loan officer. Uh, you don't need me as a real estate broker to tell you you don't make enough money. You already know you don't make enough money, all right? So who do you need? You need someone to help you. You need to partner up with somebody. It could be a brother, it could be a sister, it could be mom or dad, it could be an uncle, uh, it could be a cousin. You know, you're buying it together, all right? Now, if you need cash, if you need cash, and of course, that is also you also know, all right? You don't need me to tell you you don't have any money, all right? You don't need a loan officer or a real estate agent to tell you you don't have any money and you don't uh, and you don't make enough money. You don't need us for that. All right. You already know. So that's the first thing you need to know is who do you need? Right. Who do you need? If you need cash for the down payment, you might want to talk to mom or dad, sister, or brother, uh, best friend, family friend, long time. And, you know, there's some rules around that. Even a cousin. And of course, actually, with cousins for FHA, FHA does not like cousins uh, helping you with down payment uh, because, uh, they have come to learn that everybody's a cousin. And uh, in a way, we're kind of all cousins. You know, we all come from Adam and Eve. So in a way, we're all cousins. So that doesn't really count with FHA. So, <laughs> so uh, cousins don't work. But uh, you may want to look at mom or dad, sister or brother, you know, uh, to help you with the down payment. Another thing you might want to look, again, this is in the context of who you need, uh, you know you don't make enough money, so we got to work with family and friends there, buy something together, partner up. And then uh, what you need, you know what you need. You need, you need money. You need money, right? And so if family and friends can't help you, you know, mom and dad, mama, mom and dad brother and sister, right, then you might want to look at the county uh, in which you live. You look at the state of California. Uh, you look at the uh, city, down payment assistance. Every city has a down payment assistance program. Most of them don't have any money. They, most of them don't have any money, uh, but you should check it out anyway. Uh, and then there are, um, let's see, uh, nonprofit organizations that also provide down payment assistance. And so know who you need and what you need, all right? Um, now, in terms of what you need, uh, you need to have some things together. And I'm gonna go into this in more detail in talking about packaging alone. I'll do that. I'll go in more detail. But some of the things you need are really pretty basic. You need to be filing your taxes. So if you haven't been filing your taxes, you know, that's a problem. All right. It doesn't really matter uh, what program it is. We do have programs for people who don't file their taxes. But we're talking about the average person. The average person, you know, you should file your taxes on time. Uh, and if you owe any money, pay the money you owe or have some type of payment history are not a payment history, but a payment arrangement for that, all right? And I'm going to go into that in more detail in a minute. All right, you need to have a job, right? You need to have a job, and uh, you need to have at least a couple years on the job. If you have been in the same line of work, that's okay, too, for a couple years. In the same line of work for a couple years, uh, that works. On the job for at least 30 days, and in the same line of work for a couple years, that works as well. Not having a job is a problem. All right, you need to have a job, uh, and it needs to be. You need to be able to. We need to be able to verify employment about uh, uh, about your job, um, and then you need to have income documentation. Some people who are self-employed, uh, well, it's, it's a little bit more complex for self-employed people. What we need to see uh, for people who have uh, wage earners, uh, then pay stubs will work just fine, and then of course, money in the bank, right? And if it's a gift that you're getting, then whoever's giving you the money, we need to see the money. 
And so they need to be willing to provide unaltered, uh, no blackouts, no crossovers. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes family members don't want the person they know that, that they're helping to know how much money they have. So they don't even want to give them the statement. They'll give it directly to the lender or they'll give it to them with, you know, everything blacked out. So all they can see is, you know, what they need to see. That doesn't work, folks. It doesn't work at all. We got to have the complete statement unaltered. All right. We got to have that. So uh, whoever is going to give you the money, you can't borrow the money, by the way. Cannot borrow the money. All right. Cannot borrow the money. It's got to be your money or someone else's money and they're giving it to you. And then a couple other things that we're going to look at uh, is kind of how you're managing your affairs. And so we'll need to see your bank statements. And we see a whole bunch of NSFs. That's a problem, folks. It is. So uh, you might want to start working on that right away, working on that right away, because we're going to need at least two months of bank statements um, uh, to uh, kind of see where the money is coming from. In fact, uh, where are you getting the money? They look at that. They actually look at the deposits. And we see a lot of cash deposits. That's a problem, too. That is a problem. So you might want to, uh, you know, take a good look of how you live it, where the money's coming from, uh, because large deposits, cash deposits, we have to track that stuff, right? And we can't use deposits we can't track. So any money you have in the bank, it's got to come from a verifiable source, a job, or maybe you've got a tax refund, or someone, uh, your parents gifted you funds. We need to be able to track it to the source as part of the Patriot Act. It's no joke. Uh, we got to, you know, we got to see the money. Show me the money. Show me the source of the money. So know who you need and what you need. And that's just kind of a high level overview of income documentation and job uh, asset verification and the statements uh, and uh, as well as, uh, you know, being able just to verify the information. You're going to be asked a lot of questions. Uh, there's a whole section in the application, decorations. You know, have you ever, you know, been in default on a federal debt, a student loan, right? If you have student loan debt, you know, be prepared uh, because we have to count that student loan debt. And there are some ways to uh, work around that, all right? And so... Uh, one of the things you can do with student loan debt is that you can ask for the longest term possible, uh, a 25-year term uh, at the lowest possible rate, so it doesn't impact you as much in terms of your payment. If you don't have to make payments on your student loan debt, that's still a problem with some programs. There are some programs, if there's no payment, then we're not going to count it. But there are other programs that they doesn't care. They don't care if there's no payment. They don't care. We got to hit you with a payment. So you need to find out what the payment would be on the longest possible term so we can add that in. Otherwise, we're going to hit you with 1% of the payment per month. And uh, you don't want that. That would just make it really, really difficult uh, to qualify. Another thing, too, is that uh, we're going to need at least a three months of bank statements if you're claiming to be a first time home buyer. And what is a first time home buyer? A first-time home buyer is a person who has not owned a home in the last three years. And so normally we want two months of bank statements. Normally we want two years of tax returns. Uh, but if you're claiming to be a first-time home buyer and we're putting you into a traditional first-time home buyer program, we're going to need to see three years of tax returns and three uh, months, particularly of bank statements. All right. So those are some of the things that we're going to need. The other thing you want to take, uh, you want to understand about your situation is how much you can really afford. Now, uh, most lenders use a rule called 26 over 38 or 36. Uh, the, real, the real number is not 26 or 28 over 36, 28 representing the percentage of your house payment of your gross income, right? So if you uh, make $1,000 a month, your house payment can't be more than $280 a month, all right? So 28 over 36, 36 represents your total debt ratio. That's the house payment as well as the other debt that you have. And so your total debt, and by the way, it's not all the debt. Like we don't count the payment you're making to the, to the gym. 
we don't count the payments you're making to cable. We know you're paying $250 to $300 a month to cable. We know, but we don't count it. We don't count the money you're uh, paying to your, for child care, 500 bucks a week. You know, we don't count that. We don't count the money you're paying on your auto insurance, uh, your life insurance, your health insurance. We don't count any of those expenses. None of them. All we count is what's being reported to the credit bureaus, right? And so that's credit cards, car payments, and alimony and child support. And sometimes child support child support is being reported by most uh, district attorney's offices, but alimony is not, all right? And so we'll be looking at that. That's one thing that's not being reported to the uh, credit bureaus, uh, but it's something that many people are paying, alimony and uh, child support. And so um, we're counting primarily things that report to the credit bureau and the maximum your debt ratio can be under the kind of the traditional guidelines is 36. So 360 bucks total debt if you make $1,000 a month or $280 a month for just a house payment, right? Now, let me tell you what the real number is. The real number is that we can go as high as 42, 43, and maybe even 44. It just depends on what the automated decision engine is saying. But 43 is kind of, you know, 42. Um, in fact, if you really want to be safe, don't go a hair over 41.9. All right. That's where you want to be. 41.9 or $410.90 on a $1,000 gross income. That's where you want to be for the housing payment. And then the back end ratio, depending on what it is, so we're doing government, 56.9. All right. You cannot go to 57. 56.9. And some lenders won't allow that. They have credit overlays, and they'll cut you back to 50, all right? And some will cut you back to 47, all right? It just depends on the lender. It depends on the lender. 46 or 56.9 is the max FHA you can go. And uh, there are some cases with VA that you can go even higher than that, 60%, 60%, maybe even 65, all right? It can happen because outside of debt ratio, they have another way of looking at your income uh, and your ability to pay through disposable income. There's some, you know, there's a way they go about doing that. So here's the one that you can consider, even though the lender says you are approved and uh, we approve you at the max, 56.9 or, or 55 or 50, right? One of the things you have to consider is what can you really afford? That's number two. Know what you can really afford. All right, think about the rent you're paying right now. Are you knocking down that rent with no problem? Are you trying to put it together at the very last minute to make that rent payment? And if that's you, if you're trying to put it together at the last day of the month to be it on time, or you're always late paying the rent you're paying, chances are you cannot afford more than what you're paying in rent. That is the reality. You cannot afford what you're paying in rent. That's just the truth. And of course, nobody wants to hear that, right? Because you may not be paying market rents. You may not even be paying market rents. You've been there for a long time and you're probably not even paying market rents. If you're paying market rents, <clears throat> then you might be okay. Because if you're paying market rents, there's a good possibility you can find something, uh, you can buy something at or maybe slightly above market rents. But if you're struggling to pay the rent you're paying right now, then that's an indication of where your house payment needs to be. Another thing to consider is that look at your net income because the lender is basing your qualification on your gross income. I don't know about you, but when I used to work at Wells Fargo and Wells and Washington Mutual and all these big banks, I, I did well. I made a lot of money, but I paid a lot of money in taxes. I mean, I did not live on my gross income. I lived on my net. And my net was about 40% of my gross. I had hit hard because a lot of my income was commission income like it is now. And so when you are in commission, you are getting hit hard. But I'm even seeing people who are wage earners. You add your state and your federal taxes together, plus then unemployment taxes it's almost 50%. It's like in the high 40s. You're paying in taxes. That's another reason to buy a home, right? And so you got to look at, you don't live on your gross pay. You live on your net pay. 
That's what you're really living on, right? And so what is your real debt ratio? Let me tell you, if we have a person with a back-end debt ratio, gross of close to 50%, that means their real debt ratio, based on the real money flowing through their bank account to pay bills and to live, is about 70, maybe 75%. We're talking about living on 25 to 30% of their gross income. So if their gross income is $10,000 a month, we're talking about three grand is what they're actually living on. But because they have a, uh, because they make 10 grand a month and they went big woolly style and they have a house appointment almost three grand a month, you know they're struggling. You know they're struggling to make ends meet, although they qualified for that house. Heck, it was only 30% front-end ratio of their gross income. So you got to know how much you can afford. Uh, don't buy off, buy off, bite off. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't bite off more than you can chew. You don't, don't do that. It's, uh, it's just going to get you in trouble. Now, when you really understand what you can afford, then you need to move to number three and kind of think about how you're living, right? Some people, you know, because of renting, one of the great things about renting is that it gives you an opportunity to live a lifestyle that you probably can't afford if you were buying. I mean, that's just the truth. You know, you can rent a house in Beverly Hills for six, seven thousand dollars a month trying to buy that house. It's going to cost you fifteen thousand dollars a month, right? I mean, um, I don't know if I, I mean think about some of these homes that you can rent, even apartments. I mean, downtown uh, in most of these downtown areas in urban centers, Chicago, L.A., New York, an apartments, one bedroom apartments are renting for two to three thousand dollars a month. And if, do you know though you can if you bought an apartment downtown? Uh, you can't buy an apartment, buy an apartment downtown Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles for probably less than seven to eight hundred thousand dollars. All right. An apartment owning it. Right. So uh, this would be a high end, a nice condominium, something that kind of measures up to your standard of living that you want to have. And so that's one of the great things about renting is that you can live in this make believe world of uh, being a really nice neighborhood and having all the amenities that you can ever imagine. Uh, and it only costs you two or three or four thousand dollars a month. Try to buy that and it's all going to double or triple. So um, know where you, you know, you got to really know what's real, right? Know what's real. Uh, understand the market you're buying in because you may not be able you may not be able to buy in the market you live in. You may have to go east. You may have to go east where there's some affordability. And I know what that's going to do. No more riding the bike or walking to work. I get it. No more stopping by Starbucks, you know, getting a cafe mocha, you know, with a double shot and heading into the office. It's just you don't have all those conveniences. Now you got to, you know, drive the car to the train and, take the train to the bus, and then take the bus to the ferry, and then the ferry to the taxi, and then the taxi to work, all right? I mean, so I get it, uh, because you had to drive that far off to buy something that you can call your own. So uh, this is really tough. A lot of people aren't buying because they just do not want to drive. They do not want to uh, deal with the the circumstances uh, that that represents being stuck in traffic, uh, having to take the train and the bus, you know, uh, BART or down here. I mean, it's just, it's challenging. I get that. So what are you going to do? You got to make a, a decision about, you know, really how important is home ownership to you? And um, for a lot of millennials, it's not more important than their lifestyle and the conveniences that their current income provides. And they just rather, you know, kind of live it out right now, you know, and just to try to avoid buying as for as long as they possibly can until they have no choice. And unfortunately, uh, when you wait till you have no choice to buy, it's probably gonna be too late. All right, so what do you do? Um, you, you don't look 
uh, for in areas in which you know that you can't afford. You don't do that. You cannot afford downtown. Don't look downtown. Understand the median price for your area and look on the map. Talk to your agent. Find out what the median prices are in the community that you can afford and start looking there. Another thing, too, is that if you want to buy where you live, uh, then it's absolutely critical that you start thinking about partnering up uh, with someone. So nothing wrong with two or three people getting together to buy a four-unit building. Yes, I know it's going to cost you $1.2 million, but the four of you can pull your monies together and buy that thing. Each of you have your own property. Nothing wrong with two people getting together and buying a house or a two-unit building, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. Don't be naive. The market is not going to wait for you. It is not. Prices are not going to adjust for you. They are not. There will be an adjustment, but not like you think. All right. And when the adjustment occurs, you won't have the benefit of the low interest rates that exist today. So these are some of the harsh realities that, you know, a lot of people are hearing for the first time when they sit down with their lender. And uh, these are things that, you know, if uh, you just kind of think about, um, uh, you will know that uh, you need to get real quick and do something now uh, before you can't do anything at all. Number four, you need to raise your credit score. You know that a good credit is the beginning. It's, it's the beginning to building wealth. It really is. Uh, you know, when you have really good credit, you need less money down. I mean, there are programs that just reward you for really good credit. I mean, they will give you the down payment and the closing costs with really good credit. Or if you have the down payment with really good credit, you can get an interest credit from the lender that will probably take care of all of your closing costs that you can get in with just the down payment. And so now is the time to start working on your credit score. The number one thing you can do to work on your credit score is to first order your credit score. And I'm not talking about Credit Karma or uh, free, free uh, credit check total. I'm talking about MyFICO.com. All right, go to MyFICO, set it up, get all three scores. It's all the lenders use FICO scoring. They all use it. You know, there are like nine different FICO scoring models. And so I can tell you right now, you're not even close uh, relying on Credit Karma and what if uh, uh, the free credit check total and and all these various free websites. They're free for a reason. It's just a reason, just a way to advertise. That's all. They're, they're getting paid on the other side from advertisers uh, thinking that you have an accurate credit report that you can use to get a home loan. No, it's not true. The only way you can determine what your accurate FICO score is is to apply to a lender. Unfortunately, that's what it is. Our lenders use authorized, federally approved credit agencies because these are federally insured uh, institutions uh, that rely, you know, they have to use credit reporting agencies that are, uh, that are regulated, uh, that follow the rules, that have contracts with all the major credit bureaus and, um, uh, and there are special algorithms that these lenders uh, are able to customize for the credit reports they run. Uh, and so your free credit, credit your free credit reports to, the, to Discover Card and Visa, worthless. Credit Karma, worthless. Free credit tech, worthless. It, honestly, it is. You need to get a real credit report, right? And even my FICO score, that's a little closer, more accurate of a FICO score report that you can use. Uh, but the best way to do is to get started with a pre-approval with a lender and get it ran by the lender. Yes, it's going to cost you money. Those reports are not free, but you'll know it's real and you can start working on your credit score. The other thing you can do in addition to uh, getting your credit report from all three bureaus, you can start reviewing them every month and just making sure there's no mistakes on your credit report. Uh, these things can cause a problem. Make sure your social security number is right. Make sure that your address is right, your employment is right. Make sure there's no mistakes on your credit report at all. Another thing you can do is start paying off balances. Try not to carry a balance at all, all right? If you carry a balance, uh, make sure it's a balance for gas and food and things of that nature that you can pay off every month. Do not carry a balance at all, all right? Start really working on that, and that will have a dramatic increase on your credit score. And number five, pay off debt. Um, the number one inhibitor to buy a house today is car loans. I, I tell you, 
Um, I, I see so many applications with people with car loans, and I just think, man, if they didn't have that $600, $700, $800, $1,000, $1,500, $1, yes, $2,500 car payments. Yes, they're out there. All right, if they didn't have that, they could qualify for five hundred thousand instead of three hundred, or five hundred, or, or, or um, uh, seven hundred fifty instead of five hundred, or one million instead of seven hundred fifty. Uh, car payments rob you of your purchasing power. They do. Do not finance cars. Buy a used car, pay cash. If you must finance, do it in twelve to twenty-four months. No longer than that. And if you have to go longer than that because you just got to have that car, double up on the payments and get rid of that doggone thing because you can't live in it, right? You can't write it off. It's not helping you at all, but to get the point A and point B. And really, when you think about how much time you spend in it, an hour to work and an hour at home, and then it sits in the parking lot all day, you really need to think uh, differently about transportation, and how important it is and what you can do to save yourself money. I mean, it's not just a car payment. It's the, it's the insurance and everything else associated with it. All right, so pay off debt, right? Everything you can pay off, pay off. Pay off the car, pay off, uh, pay off uh, student loans if you can do it. You know, if you can't do it, extend those things out as far as you can. Uh, pay off credit card debt by all means necessary. Okay, number six is have your taxes in order. I spoke about this earlier. You got to file your taxes, right? If you're on an extension, get it handled, right? That should be something you should start working on right now. In fact, we're in October. Now is the time to start getting your stuff together to file your taxes on time. Instead of filing on April 15th and getting a refund, if you have a refund, in June or July, why not file on the 1st of January you know, you don't even don't wait on your uh, employer with the W-2s. You can go online and get that information. You can, if you got a year to date on your pay stub, you can uh, go with the year to date on your pay stub. Shoot, estimate that stuff. Get as close to the number as possible. And if it's that far off, file an amended return. But get your to get your money. They're robbing you every month. The 30, 40 percent of your income. Get your stuff together. File your taxes. In January, in January, if you have a refund coming, you might be able to use that money towards a down payment or to pay off debt. If you don't have a refund coming, well, now you can start planning, you know, and, and start working on getting that debt paid off. The other thing, too, maybe you can find out now what you owe and make an adjustment over the next three months so you don't owe any money and have to have payment arrangements. I tell you, now is the time to sit down with your tax professional and get your taxes in order. So as I mentioned before, we're going to need three years of tax returns to prove that you don't own a home, you haven't owned a home in the last three years. Uh, and we're going to also look at what you actually filed. So back in the day, we used to trust what you gave us, not anymore. In addition to receiving your tax returns, we have you sign a 4506 well, we're getting a copy from the IRS directly. Make sure you're not giving us something that you didn't actually file. So uh, the days of committing fraud and misrepresenting things are over. They really are. You need to file your taxes. You need to give us a copy of your taxes. And if you owe any money, you need to pay it. You need to pay it. Now, the good news is only money is not going to stop you from buying a home. It is not. Not going to stop you from buying a home. So uh, just get them filed, and, and if you owe money, set up a payment arrangement, make it as long as possible, with the lowest payment as possible, so it doesn't impact you in buying a home. I hope this was good information and that you are uh, taking notes from this. If not, you can watch the show again. And then number seven, avoid any big purchases, right? So um, if you haven't bought a car, now is the time, now is not the time to go do so, right? If you or think about, you know, refurnishing your apartment and, Getting that couch you've been looking at, stop, stop it right now. Don't even think about it. Uh, don't make any big purchases whatsoever. The goal is to be debt free. Pay cash for it if you gotta have it. If you gotta have it, write a check or better yet, use your debit card. Pay cash for it if you have to have it. All right. So that's the. Uh, those are seven things you really need to think about. 
Um, and one more thing, too. Let me add an eighth thing. Have a family meeting, all right? It's so important. Husband and wife, are you and your significant others are together on this, you know, together on where you want to live, together on how much you want your payment to be, together on what type of home you want to buy. You got to be together on this. I mean, until you get together, you can't even start the process. Uh, just forget about it. I've been married for 36 years. It'll be 37 on December 19th. All right. I've been married for a long time. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm here to tell you, if you're not together, you can just forget about it. Forget about it. It's not going to happen. All right. You need to be together when it comes to where you're going to buy, how much you're going to spend, you know, uh, the type of property you're going to buy, the amenities you're going to have. Are you going to buy a condo? Are you going to buy a manufactured house? Are you going to buy land and build something from scratch, which is a great idea, by the way? I mean, what are you going to do? Come together on it. And then you need to be together on the finances. Okay, we need to save a certain amount of money. Okay, what do you need to save? How are we going to save the money? How much, you, you know, she works, you work. How much money is going to come from you? How much money is going to come for her? Are we going to set up a separate account so we don't commingle the funds and have our house account? I mean, how are we going to do this? What is the plan? Right. Are we going to start living on a budget, cutting back on certain things? You've got to be together on this or it's not going to work. Can I get an amen out there from the married folks? If you're not together on it, it is not going to happen. It is simply not going to happen. All right. So a family member, a family meeting is so, so very important. All right. Now, I spend most of the time here talking about the seven things you need to know before you even get started. And I haven't even gotten into the documentation requirements, but I have alluded to them. And so this will go very, very quickly. Uh, we're not going to take a break. Uh, normally we would, a commercial break. But since we're at the 8 o'clock hour, we're going to continue and see if we can knock this out in the next 10 minutes. So the first thing you want to do in applying for a mortgage is to have everything together first. You're going to sit down. You're going to take the application either over the phone or online. Please you know, make it an appointment. It's a scheduled appointment. Don't do it, you know, out the blue. Don't say, okay, I'm just going to do it right now. Don't make it an emotional thing. You know, plan it out. Say, okay, you're going to meet with your loan officer at four o'clock in the afternoon or Saturday at nine o'clock. Plan it out. And in that time period, get your stuff together. Get your taxes, get your pay stubs, get everything together, get your bank statements so you can do a good job on the application. So complete the application in detail. It's so important you do so. Uh, one of the things that we always see missing is that a client doesn't put down their full resident, residency history. We need two years. So we need to complete addresses of two years of residency. We need two years of employment, right? And uh, by the way, going back to residency, we need two years of residency. If you've been renting, we need the landlord information. Now, the application doesn't provide that on that on the first three pages, four pages, but there's a note section. There's a, the last page of the application whether it be you're doing it live or online, what have you, is a section that put information like that, the landlord, name, address, telephone number, email address, so we can have that. Same thing uh, for employment history. So you know the address where you work right now, but you know we need to know where you worked before. We need to have two years of employment history. And if there's any gaps in employment, we need to have an explanation. Why weren't you working for six months or three months, right? What were you doing? Were you looking for work and why? We'll need a letter of explanation on any gaps in employment. And by the way, you know, when we look at your credit report, we're looking to verify this information. Did you know your employment information is on your credit report? We're looking at your credit report to see if you've given us all your employers. We're looking at your credit report to see if you've given us all your addresses. Why? Because that's what the underwriter is going to do. And they're going to say, well, whose address is this? Right. We've had to do that. We've had the people who had to go back and adjust their application, add in additional addresses because they've moved five times in, 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 in two years. Right? So uh, it's uh, it's very important that you complete the application in detail. And then if you're married, you have to have your wife's information. And if you're trying to do the loan without your spouse, well, if you're doing a government loan, an FHA loan, we need your spouse's information anyway. We'll have to get her authorization to run her credit report because we have to add her debt to your debt. What is, uh, you know, her debt is now your debt, right? That's what it is. And your debt is her debt. It goes both ways. 
when you're buying a home using FHA or government financing. And so if your spouse is involved and will need, you know, same thing with her, because even though we have a joint credit report, you both at one point were individuals, right? And unless you've been together for a very long time, your information will all be the same in the last two years. But we've had situations where the spouse had various addresses on her credit report and uh, also various uh, employment information. So we need to have the wife's information. If you're using a co-signer, we need the co-signer's information. And so, and Neil, by the way, the co-signer will need to do a separate application. Your wife, you can do a joint application. But if you're being a co-signer, a co-signer needs to do their own application in the process. Um, let's see here. So the other thing now, you provided us complete information on address and employment. Then it's going to ask for banking information, all right? And so you don't have to put the actual account numbers on there because we're going to have the bank statements. you got to provide us the bank statements, as I mentioned before. We're going to need three months' worth of bank statements, three years of the tax returns. Uh, ideally, you know, if you're not doing down payment assistance, two years of tax returns, two months of bank statements, but we're going to need that. If we have a lot of NSFs uh, on the bank statements, you're going to have to write explanations about what happened, right? We're going to have to do that. A lot of overdrafts, you're going to have to explain what happened. It's very important. So we'll need the bank statements and we'll need your pay stubs. Um, we'll need your tax returns and your pay stubs. Now, in the tax returns, we need all the schedules, Schedule A, if you already a homeowner and you have additional deductions, we'll need Schedule B for, for interest and investments you may have. We'll need Schedule C if you have a small business. And man, oh man, I certainly hope you don't have a small business. I had a client the other day who's doing some type of multi-level company, had uh, $1,000 in income and $20,000 of expenses. Uh, that helped them on their taxes. They had a huge, nice write-off but that also go, went against their income and reduced their purchasing power. So you should consult with your tax and uh, with your mortgage professional. Forget about your tax professional because all they want to do is reduce your taxes. You should consult with your mortgage professional if you haven't bought a home and you're thinking about starting any type of part-time business uh, because it can impact your ability to buy a home. Okay, what is the other thing you have? And... Um, in addition to looking at all those schedules, oh, don't let me forget. So we have your Schedule C, right? That's for self-employed people if you have a small business. Then you have your Schedule E, and this is for people that have corporations, right? You may not own a home, but you own a business, you own a corporation, or, you're, or you have greater than 25% in some corporation. That income is going to be reported on your Schedule E as a K-1 distribution of some type. And so we'll need, perhaps, if you own more than 25%, of that corporation, and it'll indicate so on the K-1, we'll need to see those corporate returns, all right? Same thing if you have a partnership. We'll need to see your partnership returns. That's a 1065, and 1120, or 1120S. And so if you're self-employed, it gets a little bit more complex. We got to have all the schedules, folks, all the schedules. And by the way, the good news is we only need the federal schedules, not the state, just the federal schedules. Now, if you're self-employed, it goes even deeper than that because, you know, we're looking at this. Here we are almost at the end of 2018. What in the heck does your 2017 taxes have to do with your business today? Nothing. I mean, that's the truth, right? Who knows? You could be on your way out of business. And so um, all lenders are going to require a year-to-day P&L, a year-to-day profit and loss statement. Uh, up to September 30th. We just concluded September 30th, maybe October, maybe August 30th, since we just concluded uh, September 30th. But we're going to need a year-to-date P&L. And if you don't have a year-to-date P&L and you're handling your own books, I highly recommend Quicken. Get set up on Quicken. And But I even have a better recommendation for you. Get an accountant, all right? Don't be penny-wise and dollar-foolish. Don't be penny-wise and and dollar foolish. I don't know, what is it with this DYI, do-it-yourself movement? Uh, I mean, it's not true. It's not real. You can't do everything. I am certainly not buying into the movement. I don't do, not, I don't do anything I'm not trained to do. Forget about it. I'd rather pay the professional, get it done right the first time. All right? So the DYI movement is not for me. So hire an accountant. 
uh, and get your taxes done right and also hire an accountant to get your books done right if you're running a business so that you can have the reports you need for loans and, and things of that nature. All right, so we need all the schedules, folks, 1065s, 1120, 1120S, um, 1040s. We need all the schedules. We don't need your state taxes. If you're a wage earner, then we need your last 30 days of pay stubs. And if you're not getting a pay stub that's printed and has a year to date on there, uh, then we're going to need to do a verification of employment. And we're going to have your employer fill it out in detail. And I tell you, if I have to send back another verification to be filled out correctly by an HR department, I'm going to scream. Sometimes they don't know how to do it. we got to have it completed in detail, as detailed as a pay stub would be if they had bothered to issue one to you that had all the details on it. So we're looking at your year-to-date. And you, you claim to make, you know, five grand a month, and here we are September, your year-to-date growth should be about 54000 but we said that year-to-date growth of 25000 so we need to know what happened here. Are you even sick? Or do you even, were you laid off? Are you not getting any hours? And so we're looking at those details on your pay stub, all right? I, I tell you, don't think that you are ever going to be smarter than the underwriter. Just don't do it. Save yourself the time. Uh, you're not. None of us are, all right? This is all they do all day long is to look for ways to turn down your loan. And I know they hate to hear us say that. But that's ultimately what they're doing. They are the they are the gatekeepers of the banks. The bank doesn't want a loan that are, that cannot perform. They don't want people that can't pay, and so they are the last line of defense to protect the bank from making loans to people who cannot really afford it. And so, yes, they're looking for ways to disqualify you, and if they don't find any way to disqualify you, then you're qualified or approved for the loan, and we move forward. And so we have to address these things up front. You know, I don't need an underwriter to tell me what what are the qualifications and what will get my buyer approved. I know what the underwriter knows. That's my job as a mortgage professional, to know what they know so I can advise my client uh, and to be able to move forward and get it done right the very first time. So if I can't do that, then I'm not really serving my client well. And so... Uh, don't think that I never think I'm smarter than the underwriter, but I do uh, pride myself in knowing as much as the underwriter so that I can anticipate issues when I see them and working with the client. So the income documentation, folks, is very, very important. We're looking at these things and we're making sure that uh, we're not going to have any problems in getting you approved. All right. So we've talked about bank statements. We've talked about pay stubs and tax returns. Uh, Then, of course, there's citizenship. You need to be a citizen, but if you're not a citizen, that's okay. We need your visa, and we need your I-10 number, and we need your authorization, your green card here. Uh, There are programs, if you have a work visa, but you don't have a Social Security number, and you want to buy a program, there are I-10 programs that are available for people like that, for foreign nationals. You just have to be here illegally. If you had a foreclosure, then we'll need the address of the property, that was foreclosed on. The reason why, we want to see when the actual property was sold, right? And when the notice of default was actually, and and a notice of uh, uh, the foreclosure actually took place because there are seasoning requirements. The same thing with bankruptcy. We'll need to see the actual discharge paper uh, and uh, so we can count and make sure that enough time has gone by uh, for you to qualify for the program you want. And then if you are paying child support, we need the entire divorce decree so we can see what the terms of the agreements are. And we need to see proof that you're making it if it's not being reported to the credit bureau. Same thing with alimony. We'll need to see the entire divorce decree and we'll need proof that it's being paid uh, and uh, or that you're receiving it. If you're receiving it, same thing. We need to prove that you're receiving Everybody knows there's a lot of deadbeat dads out there who don't pay child support and don't pay alimony. So if you put it down as if you're getting it and you're not, it's not going to work. We have to have proof that you're receiving the money. If you have judgments, we'll need those judgments satisfied. If they're not satisfied, you'll need to have arrangements in writing and proof that you're making the payments. If you have tax liens, we'll need those tax liens satisfied. And if they're not satisfied, that may be okay. Many The government will subordinate to a tax lien as long as you have a payment arrangement with the government and you're making the payments on time. All right, uh, 823. 
Uh, folks, so those are the things that we need uh, to help you um, become a homeowner. That's, that's how you apply for a mortgage, right? And then there's a couple other things that I should drop on you. First of all, there is an expense associated with applying for a mortgage. First, time. Because all the documents that I've just given you, with the exception of your tax returns, uh, have to be provided to us every 60 days because they're expired. In fact, even your credit report is only good for 60 days. In fact, no lender will fund on a credit report that's older than really 30 days uh, when they're ready to fund. So you're going to have credit report expenses um, every couple of months. You're going to have to pay for an updated credit report if you haven't found something yet and you're still in the game looking. Every month, you're going to have to update your, update your bank statements and pay stubs to us. And the reason why is because we don't want to make sure that nothing changes. All right. And believe it or not. And we've had people start new jobs, and that affects their loan approval. That affects their loan approval. We've had people go out and buy cars or get credit card debt, and that affects their credit their, their credit pre-approval. You can't do that stuff. You are on lockdown once you start the process of buying a home. You are on lockdown. You cannot do anything until the process is over. And then once you get under contract, there are more expenses. First of all, uh, you have to, I mean, unless you want to buy a lemon, you've got to get an appraisal and an inspection done on the property, and it's going to be at your expense. We had one transaction just happen. The appraisal came in low. Thank God the seller was willing to reduce his price to the appraised value. Otherwise, our buyer would have been out the money she spent, 450 bucks on the inspection, and $500 on the appraisal and start the process all over again. So they go find another house. She's going to be out another 450 bucks for the inspection and another $500 for the appraisal. So you have to have some money when you start the process. That's why it's so important that you follow the earlier steps. You got to save some money. You got to have some money in the bank. You know, when we talk about here, no money down and no closing costs, uh, we mean just that, no money down payment and no money for the closing costs because we're getting you a grant or a loan for the down payment and we're getting you a grant or the seller's paying your costs for the closing costs. What we are not saying is that you don't have to have the money for the earnest money deposit. So you make an offer, the seller accepts your offers with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand dollars deposit. It's like renting an apartment. You can't rent an apartment on a deposit, right? You got to have a deposit. So you got to have an earnest money deposit, right? And that earnest money says, hey, I'm in this for real. I want to buy your house. I'm putting my money where my mouth is, right? And if we're giving you credits for closing costs, down payment assistance, you could actually get that money back, right? But in addition to that earnest money deposit, the next step here is you got to get your inspection done, all right? And that inspection is going to cost four to five hundred dollars. And then you got to get the appraisal done because you want to get the inspection done right away. Because if you don't like the house, why spend the money on the appraisal, right? So that's the first thing your agent's going to do is get that inspection done immediately. Get that guy out there the next day after accepting that contract because you're going to be investing $400 to making sure you're not buying the limit. And if the inspection comes back cool, then you're going to move forward with the appraisal. Now, we won't even order the appraisal until we get... Uh, all your documentation updated again, and we're in a position to issue loan, dis loan estimate. That loan estimate will kind of reconfirm what your payments are going to be, the interest rate, everything you're going to pay. You're going to sign that loan estimate, give us authorization to move forward and submit the loan to the lender. We will register the loan with the lender. The lender will issue even additional disclosures on top of our disclosure to make sure this is what you want to do. And once the file is in underwriting, then we order the pre-approval. In some cases, we may even order, not order the pre-approval, but the appraisal. But in some cases, we may even wait because our underwriting turn time is like one to two days. We may even wait to make sure that we have an underwriting approval before we order the appraisal. In most cases, we don't because our loans always get approved. We have no fallout. And we have no turn downs. So, but that is a possibility for us. All right, so no, you gotta have some money up front, folks. You gotta have it. 
Now, I know this has been, uh, geez, we've been at this for an hour and a half, and I appreciate those of you who have taken time to hang in there with me. If you have any questions, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. My name is Eric Frazier. I'm the broker of The Power Is Now Real Estate Services and Mortgage Services. If you want to get started, go to applytobuynow.com. Applytobuynow.com. Or never lease again. And you're right, uh, Fadi. Lease Never buy? No, you're not right, Fadi. Uh, buy, never lease. <laughs> I thought you said lease, never buy. Not true. I mean, you are saying that. No, you do not want to lease, and especially you do not want to lease to option to buy. That is the worst deal that you ever get into. The only person that benefits is the seller, not the buyer. So you never want to lease, you always want to buy. In fact, go to NeverLeaseAgain.com, NeverLeaseAgain.com, buddy, that's just for you, NeverLeaseAgain.com, and uh, get started tonight in buying a home. If you need help with credit, credit restoration, uh, budgeting, go to NeverRentAgain.com, and we have programs there available for you. If you need help, you need coaching, uh, you need guidance uh, in the process, uh, you have a one-year plan, a two-year plan. We're here for you to help you in any way you need help. As you can see, I love this business. I love uh, talking about uh, homeownership and finances. It is what I do. It is what I do. And uh, I've been at it for a long time now, 36 years, folks. I've been helping people make homeownership dreams a reality, and I want to help you do the same thing. So if you are ready to buy, now is the time. The power is now to buy. It really is. And um, I encourage you to take advantage while you can uh, of the low interest rates that are available, of the property, of the properties that are for sale on the market and more coming on the market. Um, this is still the time to buy. If you own a home already, I encourage you to start stack, stacking some cash. You're sitting on some equity right now that you can get at 4 or 5%. Why not get it, take advantage of it, stack that cash, because there's some opportunities coming your way for investment property, for commercial property, to continue to build your portfolio of real estate and build wealth. All right. I'm going to check and see if I have any other questions on the Facebook Live. So good to see E.J. Corbett in the house, Cheryl McNeil. Uh, those of you who have tuned in, please share the link uh, to everyone you know. I appreciate the support. Uh, follow us on uh, Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. And also uh, subscribe to us on, on uh, iTunes, where you can follow us on iTunes and check check. You know, check out all the past programming, also on Block Talk Radio, TuneIn, Spreaker, and a host of other online radio platforms. I want to encourage you also to check out the Powers Now magazine. Uh, every month we're issuing a, a magazine that has some great content and information. Uh, I tell you, I, I appreciate my team that uh, makes it happen every single month, uh, providing some great insight on what's going on in the market and in real estate uh, with loans. It's all there, folks. In addition to that, the Power is Now radio magazine, where you can get some insight on some of the people we've interviewed on the Power is Now radio. And uh, in fact, you can listen to past shows on our website on thepowershow.com on the Power is Now radio uh, icon there. All right. You're listening to The Power Is Now. Thank you for joining me this evening. I want to encourage you to tune in on Thursday, where we'll be uh, doing it again, talking about uh, real estate for sale, business opportunities. And uh, man, there's some great business opportunities that are out there right now. There really are. And um, I don't know why, uh, especially those who are Investors don't think about buying business opportunities in addition to real estate because uh, there's an opportunity to do so uh, right now. And I think those opportunities are going to continue. All right. Um, I'm going to play one last final commercial. 
And uh, I encourage you to uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, remember, we are our best and we maximize our success when we act now. The power is now. Thank you for joining me this evening. LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Blogger, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube. Even if you do use Facebook or Twitter, your time is too valuable to put in the hundreds of hours it takes to make these social media sites work as promotional tools for your business. 95% of all buyers start their search on the internet. Are you there? All marketers say Facebook is important to their lead generation strategies. The Power Is Now social media service is a powerful new tool designed specifically to help you get ahead of the competition. Find us at thepowerisnow.com under the services tab and change the way you do business forever. The Power Is Now. The future is here. Time flies, doesn't it? And it never seems to be quite enough, no matter how well you manage it. That's why The Power Is Now is here to help. Whether you're an agent, broker, entrepreneur, or small business owner, you need a business coach. Some of the best industry leaders are here to share their wisdom with you. So find us at thepowerisnow.com under the services tab and change the way you do business forever. Thepowerisnow.com. The next level is here. Looking back, I certainly recall one of the greatest moments in my life. The day I set foot in a house that I purchased on my own. Man, what a morning I'll never forget. The American dream lives on. The Power Is Now Buyers Club is here to help you achieve it right now. We have access to lenders and nonprofits who are willing to give you the down payment for a home when others are not. That's right. The down payment assistance is not a loan. It's a gift. Find us at thepowerisnow.com and let's talk. Own your home today. Live the American dream. Thepowerisnow.com. The future is here. to the power is now radio for more information about the show check us out at thepowerisnow.com or find us on facebook linkedin and twitter